was just told a few minutes ago that our opening slide is a little bit creepy. <laughs> so based on that feedback, I'm going to leave it up for quite a while. So the, the understanding we're talking about here is understanding text. So this talk is about how deep learning has really transformed uh, the way we conceptually understand uh, text that's injected to our engine. And a lot of the deep learning work is about image and video. Um, just a little bit uh, is about text. But I would even argue that text uh, could have much greater impact if we can understand it uh, than images and video. So just as an example of how much information is in text, before joining Loop AI, uh, I worked on a project where we were looking at the text for, from people with degenerative diseases. And just based on what they say, we were able to figure out which degenerative disease they had, and in some cases even predict a long way out whether they would get uh, such a disease, like Alzheimer's. So if our language can say something about what diseases we have, uh, what else can it tell us about us and about the things we are describing? And the answer is a whole lot. Uh, and, and people are starting to, to realize this. And in fact, uh, we've been approached by a lot of huge companies that are sitting on tons of text data. Okay? Because text for the past 10 years has been easy to get, easy to store. And so now uh, we have all this text data with a lot of valuable insights, um, but it's hard to understand. So even though you know, our approach was to go after small companies that don't have data scientists, don't have analytics teams, uh, by far the greater interest is from these larger companies uh, who have data analysis teams, but they're used to working with uh, structured data, not unstructured data like, like text. And as we all know, any company, when they have their text, they have the problem that their text is specific to their industry. Right? And that's pretty well known. Uh, medical text is different than text and travel. Um, but it goes much deeper than just specific to an industry. You know, one, of our, uh, one of our partners, they, they have repair data, uh, auto automotive repair data. And the data is very different from one dealership to the next. So even within the same company, uh, the data is uh, very wide ranging. And so you need a technique uh, like deep learning that can really uh, automatically uncover all of these concepts and, and the different ways people say things. So with all these companies, we've, we've learned a little bit about exactly what they want. Uh, first, they want from their text data to be converted to something structured and consistent. And this is because they know how to deal with structured data. They have analytics teams that know their domain, uh, know their problems. And so they want us to fill the role of transforming unstructured text to uh, structured representations. As I just mentioned, uh, highly uh, domain-specific models. Uh, and that's bolded here because that's mostly what this talk is about and what uh, deep learning enables. Um, also, companies are very protective of their data. So um, you know, this movement to the cloud um, has, its, has its limitations because a lot of them want their data to stay in-house. And so we have to provide solutions uh, that are on-premise. And then a subset of, of these companies really want a very lightweight deployment. They want to be able to analyze text um, that's on a phone, on the phone. Uh, IoT devices, they want to be able to analyze on that. So we have this simultaneous problem of... Uh, you know, analyzing text and modeling text and deep learning is this huge, computationally heavy thing. Uh, but when it's actually uh, deployed, it's got to be uh, lightweight. So I'm going to say a little bit about, uh, I'll give a few examples of construct, uh, structured consistent output. Uh, this first example is from Yelp. And this is actually the least common example, but uh, that's the one people latch on to uh, very easily. Uh, so you have Yelp reviews, you see the star rating, but if you're actually going to invite people to the restaurant, you want to dig down into the reviews and uh, actually figure out whether it's someplace you'd like to go. And the reviews contain all the information you want. You just have to dig in and find it. So, But you can look at these concepts expressed here, that they're reasonably priced, um, people are go back regularly, and you can convert that to a structured representation. When you combine that with sentiment analysis, uh, you can find all the aspects, all the concepts that are strong for a given restaurant and give it a star rating for each one of the, those aspects. 
So that's a case where you're starting from unstructured text data and you're actually displaying to an end user uh, the structured version uh, so they can get value of it, out of it. More common, though, is when you want to use that structured data for some other process. So take a movie, for example. We've had a lot of interest about movie recommendation engines. Uh, you might want to take a set of reviews about a movie and produce this structured representation that you can use then for collaborative filtering, content filtering, uh, any sort of the standard machine learning uh, recommendation techniques uh, that you would normally apply to structured data, now you can indirectly apply to text. And of course, what they really want is uh, not Yelp data, not uh, public movie data. They want their data and their discussion groups, their databases, uh, their CRMs, uh, emails, and so forth. Okay, now everyone understands uh, that you need to be domain specific, but there are a couple of nuances that, that are important uh, that you may not have, have thought of. Uh, the first is you know, that there are many ways to say the same thing. Uh, that's, that's one standard way. Uh, but then we have the, the notion of context. One word um, used in a different context means something different. Here, um, a guy thinks he's getting proposed to, um, but then you get the rest of the context and it's something uh, completely different. So the, the, this is what deep learning allows us to do, is to uncover um, not just a meaning of the word like you'd have in some standard built ontology, uh, but actually pull out for a given context what is the meaning of that word. Okay. Another thing is that uh, the definition of a concept is different in different um, scenarios. So if I ask this audience, or I say, you know, a GPU is just a CPU, right? You might say, ah, he, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, whereas if I say the same thing to people at NVIDIA, I'm like, what? You know, these are completely different context, concepts. Whereas you tell someone in fashion or travel, and, uh, you know, to them it's just the same thing. So, so you're, you want your modeling uh, technique to uncover these nuances and this uh, different granularity uh, of concepts. So we've, we've built a, a cognitive computing platform that does this in, a, in an unsupervised manner. Okay? So we take in some corpus specific to that company, their emails or their customer service logs, uh, their online chats, whatever that is, and we, we run it through our unsupervised learning uh, technique, our appliance, and this learns all of the different uh, word embeddings and the relationships among the words and, and so forth. That feeds into uh, concept extraction. This is actually a very big box in the, the system, but it's, um, I guess it's less sexy, so we made it uh, smaller. But there's a lot of work in figuring out, okay, what, what is a concept? You have a set of words, but what makes a good concept? And then beyond that, what is actually interesting to the end use case? Okay. Those are very difficult uh, problems to solve. And what we do is we take those word embeddings, we take those relationships among concepts, among words, um, and we put them in something we call the loop cortex, uh, which is what we can then deploy um, on our, uh, our reasoning platform. So the, the reasoning appliance takes this loop, loop cortex in some new bit of data, like uh, you know, a new movie review, a new customer support log, and it can do one of many things to it. At the top, we have um, kind of our most common one, which is to encode the digital genome. The digital genome is those graphics I showed you earlier, where we took the frozen movie and we produced this structured uh, representation of that movie. Um, that structured representation we call uh, the digital genome. And, and that can be used on the end to do collaborative filtering, um, used for tagging, for matching, and you know, any other analytic task that uh, involves uh, structured data. We also have uh, another partner that wants just conceptual similarity. So, you know, they have ads on their ad network, and they have candidate pages, and they want to know how conceptually similar is this ad campaign to the page um, to, to rank them and match them. And then, of course, semantic search. A lot of what our modeling uncovers is the different ways to express the same concept, and that lends uh, very naturally to, to semantic search. 
Okay, so just want to get into just a few few use cases, and I'll get into some demos. Uh, so we have um, use cases from mobile manufacturers who want to um, personalize your phone experience based on conceptually what's going on. The advertising network example. Uh, we have mobile uh, operators that really want to understand their users better to for recommendation purposes. Um, automotive examples where they're trying to understand trends and repair data and survey data and so forth. Uh, then uh, e-commerce and, and health as well. So I'm going to show you uh, some demos from the domain of movie re reviews. So we've had uh, you know, a lot of interest in, in movie recommendations for some reason. So we took about 11,000 movies, a couple million reviews, uh, which is about a gigabyte of text data, and uh, we ran it through our, our deep learning uh, appliance. And out the other end comes um, a set of, in this case, it was 900 different concepts that are specific to that, that data set. Uh, some of which are irrelevant to the movie recommendation tasks. There are concepts about theaters, um, people going to dinner before a theater, that sort of things. Uh, but a lot of them are very uh, similar um, to what Netflix, for example, is, is tagging on their movies. Okay, so let me just show you quickly what uh, the concepts look like in, in one of our viewers. So this is a viewer that shows um, overall concepts for a given domain and a, an individual concept that you can search for. So you know, we have here, this is a, one set of concepts for the movie domain. You can see we have things like witty, quirky, irreverent, deadpan, uh, irreverent, deadpan, uh, these are all highly related concepts within the movie domain, and this is something that's automatically extracted, uh, starting from the raw movie text or movie review text, um, all the way to the conceptual level. Uh, so we can type in uh, other concepts that we want to know about. You may want to learn about movies uh, with the concept of obsession, and so here you get uh, many different ways of both referring to obsession, and all these things are kind of adjunct to movies about um, obsession, jealousy, infidelity, greed, and that sort of thing. Uh, you can go the other direction and go to inspiring, um, and you get very similar things. And, and so the important point here is that, you know, with no supervision, just throwing in the data, you get some conceptual structure um, that really maps how, how people talk um, about this particular domain. Okay, then the other concept is, you know, different, one word in multiple domains means something different. So if you do spaghetti in movies, you would think that has nothing to do with it. But in fact, it's a very weak concept, but it uncovers the, the notion of the spaghetti western and, and the, the movie director and so forth. Um, we switch over to, you know, consumer electronics. And what does spaghetti mean there? Well, sp spaghetti is about spaghetti cables and rat's nest of cables and, and that sort of thing. One, one more example of that, if also in consumer electronics, I type in the word beef. Okay, this is something that's highly specific to um, even a given culture. We have that beef is really talking about a downfall or concern. Someone in consumer electronic reviews is talking about, I have a beef uh, with, with this or with that. So one final example here to kind of show you where we're, we're headed. So if I do ambiance in Yelp reviews. Okay, so with ambiance, you, you can see we have kind of this core cluster of ambiance, right? Ambiance, a different spelling of ambiance, vibe, atmosphere. That's, that's really the, the core set of, I guess, synonyms within that concept. But you also have things, clusters like upscale, classy, and elegant, right? This is like a way to describe ambiance um, all clustered together. And, and the power will come when we can relate these two clusters. And we've started down this path where we can say upscale, classy, elegant, is an example of ambiance, or is contained in, or any other uh, ontological relationship. Okay, a little bit behind here. So that's that's the learning part. Um, again, you know, any set of domain documents or whatever you can pump in, it will 
pull out uh, a conceptual map like that. The next step is uh, reasoning. So in this case, we want to produce a digital genome for movie reviews. So let's have a time for you know, one or two of these. So we may have a movie review about Frozen. We can copy this. And try to switch over to the other window. There we go. And so we can taste, paste in any bit of text uh, about a movie. We can say compute genome, and it automatically produces uh, a structured version of that. Okay, and this is just for one review. You put in a lot of reviews the, that gets more and more accurate. Um, a review for one movie is very different than a review for another. And the main point is that um, at the end, you have a structured output that other people can deal with uh, very easily. So just to wrap up, uh, so we did an experiment with, with this model, and we're essentially comparing how um, well, our system can tag movies compared to the Netflix human raiders tagging movies. Um, and then we compared it to a few other systems that work very differently from ours. So because we trained a model just on movie reviews, the concepts matched the way Netflix labeled them very well. And in fact, this first row says that 82% uh, of the time, uh, our tag, top tag, matched what Netflix had. Um, and 96% of the time, one of our top three matched uh, Netflix tag. Whereas with other systems that are based on kind of a rigid taxonomy, this one taxonomy of the world, um, they didn't do as well. Because even though they're very broad, when it comes to movies, they have comedy, drama, and, and the rough um, genres of movies, uh, but they don't go much deeper. Okay, so right now with all uh, deep learning um, approaches, we, have, uh, we require a lot of data. And so we're working on ways to uh, deal better with uh, small data sets in our training, essentially to do transfer learning. Uh, we have several requests from potential partners that they want us to incorporate structured data. So it's great that we can pull in this unstructured text and automatically pull out these concepts but there is a lot of structured data out in the world that they want us to mesh and integrate with that. And then what I was showing you with the, the ambiance examples, we want to find these areas of sub-meaning and find the relationships among them so that we can essentially not only pull out concepts, but pull out the ontological relationships um, in the data. And this will help our, our reasoning uh, engine uh, to a great degree. And finally, a plug for uh, the party tonight. There's a party at 7. There's a poster on the outside that tells you how to uh, sign up, and we hope, hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you.